welcome back to The Real Recovery Show. Um, these shows are incredibly important to me because they talk about different ways to heal or to recognize the need for healing and introducing us to the different programs or the different therapeutic modalities that could be helpful but yet because of the lack of information on a personal level we may not be able to see ourselves in that kind of situation to be able to get the help that we need um, and oftentimes the lack of information uh, that a person has about anything that that could possibly help them stops them from even looking into something because the mind tends to fill the gap of what it doesn't know with its own imagination and so we could tell ourselves ideas that you know I don't really need to do that or that's probably going to be too hard or I have for example with trauma way too much trauma and so because of it you know maybe I don't have the money that I think it's gonna take or I don't know how to find the right therapist or I don't know that my insurance will cover it or I am really afraid that I'm gonna be judged or whatever whatever it is that could possibly be something that could be quite effective in helping us to be more empowered intuitive individuals and to heal whatever it is um, could be could be just as close as making an appointment or going to um, a detox facility or going to a 12-step meeting or talking to a person who's been through it themselves. And so today's episode is going to be quite in alignment with that. Um, today's episode is going to introduce us uh, to a topic that's relatively new. Um, it is based on trauma recovery and it is uh, a modality called brain spotting and it's a really cool name but what's really cool about it is I personally have seen a change in somebody that I love very much who has incorporated brain spotting into her own recovery and so I'm excited to see in the future as this becomes more and more um, mainstream uh, what happens as just another tool for people to heal from trauma. And so over a year ago, um, Tay Tay was, um, she's, she's been doing other types of healing, different modalities therapeutically, and uh, she was in college and she was studying and she's if you know her like books are her drug <laughs> and so she'll read and research and study and um, and so when uh, she found out uh, through being online of about brain spotting intuitively it just jumped out off the page for her and there was something about this that she knew she needed to learn about mm -hmm. whatever it was um, and it was also something that she had not even heard about and so because she hadn't heard about it it was pretty surprising to her being somebody who wants to know what's out there what's available and um, and what they what they're for and how they work etc uh, for her own self but also for what she's wanting to do to know to maybe help other people um, and so first came to her that way and then she studied about it and it became part of her capstone and um, and she was in therapy um, for different things um, for trauma using different modalities and then uh, was able to work one-on-one -on -one with somebody using brain spotting and so it's really cool to be somebody who's had uh, trauma in such a high degree like I've had that I've had to work through and heal and and I still you know work through and heal some of it but so much of it has been healed uh, to watch someone else that you love who you understand like I have no judgments when somebody that I love or know has gone through trauma has trauma um, needs to heal from trauma and all of its effects uh, to watch them to watch their shoulders uh, relax a little bit more to watch them be in a situation that would trigger them in a certain way um, that they are able to walk through um, easier and easier and easier and um, and 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 I personally have been in a situation where she was triggered by something and as soon as I saw the um, 
what would trigger her I would you know kind of mama bear the situation and like and let her know like I know I'm here and yet feeling intuitively like the need for me as her friend at the time uh, to even do that was um, was was less and less necessary mm -hmm. you know to watch people heal is one of the highlights of my life to it because it keeps affirming to me the possibilities that when the mind is ready to face something and to heal something the way will appear and so it could be that today you're watching this episode because the way is appearing for you or it could just be you're curious and you want to know more and why that curiosity is, is so helpful is that it may be that somebody else is going to come into your life and they're going to need to know this and you're going to happen to know more than you think you would know otherwise about brain spotting. Or maybe you're a therapist and this is because it is a relatively new modality at the time of this recording um, that maybe you know you could look more into it and incorporate it into your own trauma recovery based therapy. And so, obviously, joined here with me is Tay Tay Singer, <laughs> um, who I, you, I've already introduced before, yeah. and she will be talking about her own experience with brain spotting. And join with me as well at this point is Leanne Lefave, um, who is actually a therapist uh, focusing on trauma based recovery. Um, and what I love also, as I've said in previous episodes, is that. Oftentimes, a person gets into a specific type of practice um, or occupation in their life because of their own experience. You know, the mind wants to heal, and the mind wants to to learn about you know why did it get sick? You know, what was going on? If they grew up with uh, dysfunction, if they had certain traumas in the mind, uh, traumas in their mind in their childhood, etc. The amount of people that are in healing professions, whether they're nurses or therapists, the amount of people, the percentage is really high for people who them, they themselves either went through something directly or watched somebody go through it and were affected by what they saw because the person was very close to them. And so, of course, you know, in alignment with that, Leanne has had her own traumas, um, and she has also gone through uh, periods with suicidal ideations, as I have, as Tay Tay has as well. And um, and and I, I love that she's so focused on healing and helping people heal from trauma. There's something that is um, intuitively very calming and uh, and and gives it an, it gives an experience of maybe I'm a little bit more safe than my trauma would let me believe normally um, because this person understands. Mm -hmm. I will say this, um, being somebody who's had to heal from a lot of trauma, um, I feel like when I would go to a therapist, I would, I would want to ask them, um, which sometimes people don't want to talk about you know they just want to be the therapist <laughs> and um and they would t and i would say you know what made you do what you're doing because there's this guard in my consciousness that's whole job is to keep me safe and it's it's fueled by my trauma and it says and it's literally hyper vigilant and it wants to analyze you to death to find out like are you are you doing this for the right reasons? How, do you really get what I'm going through? And do you really have the right answers? Can you really help me? And as long as my mind feels like it's not getting one of those three needs met, it's not going to trust. And trust is a huge issue for anyone who has trauma. Um, it's extremely, extremely important that that be the baseline of an experience. And so I've walked out of a therapist's office when they, and there's nothing wrong with this therapist, it's just that I personally couldn't feel that connection because this person was, nope, I just went to school for it, just got the degree, I have no personal experience that really like plays, nope, my life was great, childhood was great, nothing to look at here, and I don't know if on some level um, 
that was just that person's denial because why are they so invested in this? Or if it was just like I was wanting to believe that it wasn't going to help me and so I would leave, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, but it, regardless, if I didn't feel safe, I wasn't going to do it. And so there's a couple of things that we look for in healing from trauma and one of them is um, the information of, you know, what is this modality like and if I can kind of get my head wrapped around it, pun intended, um, <laughs> brain spotting, it's mm -hmm. a little joke, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, if I can get my head wrapped around it and I could kind of imagine myself in the process of doing it, what does it look like intuitively? Do I feel like there's a yes here? That's already ha that's already more than half of it. But then finding somebody that you feel like they that you can that you can work with and that you feel safe with, that you feel gets you, that you feel could get you. Um, being able to talk to them, knowing that somebody has them, has they themselves a really deep, intuitive, uh, soul-based reason uh, for wanting to help and to heal um, is also something that could be incredibly uh, comforting and helpful in the process. And so, um, Leanne used to live here in Las Vegas. She's now in Kentucky. So if you are located here in Las Vegas and you want to work with her, you could still work with her by contacting her and, um, and doing it through telehealth. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Tay Tay and Leanne to have a conversation that I'll jump into here and there about brain spotting, about being on the patient side and the therapist side, and, um, and help us to understand more about this relatively new modality. Tay -tay. Thank, thank you, Lisa. That's great. Um, hi, Leanne. Great hi. to see you. I'm glad yes. you're in town. Um, so, you know, some of the different things with brain spotting, and I like like lisa was saying um i learned about it from a facebook post um somebody was doing a training um it was january 29th of 2021 i looked it up because it was interesting to me when it happened um and um i had never heard of it and i um was writing my capstone and i was writing it on cbt which is cognitive behavioral therapy and emdr which we've talked about before and um i was really excited to learn about this next big thing that you can in, that that is actually made to be in conjunction with other things like it works well with other modalities and um it actually also triggers like points in your brain where the trauma is and so i just wanted you to let us know a little bit about like what attracted you to picking up brain spotting well, I did have a client mention it to me, and I had not heard about it. And I said, well, I'll look into it. And then I um, went to, uh, I think, a training, and, and brain spotting was part of the, it was in the training. So I got more curious, and mm -hmm. then it was like, okay, I have to do this brain spotting. So I took the training, and I love it. Mm -hmm. It works well. It, 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 yes, I love it. So you, you do mostly um, trauma-based therapy um, yes. and trauma-based recovery therapy. Um, so you work with different things like Santre play therapy because you deal with a lot of kids. Um, have you noticed that brain spotting is a good modality for both adults and children? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I have used it with children already. And yes, it, it brings out awareness that deep in the brain that nobody knows was there oh that's amazing yeah. so um would you um would you just tell us a little bit about um like from what i know um brain spotting um was created um after 9 11 um it was mm -hmm. it was actually a hybrid of emdr um where it got um a little bit of things added to it um, and it was worked on with um, some of the the first responders um, from 9-11 um, and um, I'm just curious like where you see like do you see it being a modality that works with just that kind of trauma or do you see it working in other areas of people's lives like does it have to be a super deep trauma for someone to get the effects of the, the good effects of brain spotting? 
No, actually, brain spotting can be used for a lot many other uh, causes. Uh, anxiety, um, addiction mm-hmm. is one of them. Pain. Um, I I recently did a brain spotting session on someone with a migraine, and mm-hmm. she was like in shock that we were able to in that session to reduce her her headache, wow. you know, her migraine. Uh, you can use it for um, depression. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So how does it work? Basically, everything comes to us by thoughts. It's our thought when the trauma happened that gets stuck in our brain. It's the thought that you know that gets that depression stuck in our brain. It's the anxiety that you know it comes from a thought in our brain so it's in these different brain mm-hmm. spots mm-hmm. so the idea behind it is to find that brain spot and you focus and it's more like a mindfulness mm. and you look at it and you focus on that 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 spot and all this goes deep into the body because we know trauma is very somatic too. Mm-hmm. So is anxiety, all of it. it. It comes from our brain and in our body. And so it just releases and you're able to, to resolve it by processing it completely through. And without processing that thought, you know, we, can, we stay stuck there. Right. We stay stuck there. Yeah. So this modality helps us to, to process that. That's that's really true because in my own healing from trauma, it always came down to the willingness that I had to get to question the idea that I was thinking and to be able to recognize that whatever it is, the thought is what's causing the feelings and that the thought was going to continue to cause the feelings and it was going to be very hardwired into my brain if I was thinking the thought, believing it again and feeling the feelings and then using the feelings to say that's true and then having the experience where I'm going to interpret my surroundings based on the thought. You know, I think that trauma can be, the idea of trauma can be like a very scary thing when a person thinks of it as just this like this overwhelming emotional or or frozen even emotion experience when um, when the reality is when you realize that the driver of it is still and always will be that there's there's an interpretation of an event that happened whenever in our lives that that interpretation is not in alignment with our intuition it is a scary thought Whatever it is, it says, I'm not safe, this is what's going on, I'm guilty, they're guilty, I'm a victim, I'm the victimizer, whatever it is that the trauma is, it's, it's, it's like a freeze frame. It holds on to the interpretation that is not in alignment with what really on a deep level would be true. And the mind just says, oh my God, I'm gonna die, or oh my God, this is horrible, or oh my God, blah, blah, blah. But it's still, it's always because of an idea that was accepted in the mind. And so anytime something that they see, we see in our environment, could support that idea, whatever it is, that trauma will come back and go and replay itself and say, this, is because this idea and no matter what if we don't start doing these things to help ourselves to to question the thought to get Mm -hmm. to a place of being able to let it go then it's going to be uh, the boogeyman because it's all it is because it's just an idea it's just an idea in the mind but it's an idea that is believed in and the mind is very powerful and so it holds on to an idea and gives it all of the energy all of the power that it is so sometimes like as you were saying we don't actually know what is making us react right. we don't even know what ha- we don't even right. maybe even remember what happened yes. because the brain the built-in denial system is there for our protection because if our if we believe that this thing is so horrible the mind's going to be okay well i get it let's let's quarantine that mm-hmm. and so we'll just go and focus on the feelings we're having the experience we're having the inter- the interaction with our environment that we're having not knowing that there is a thought that's driving this right. this whole time being able to sit with somebody like this and be able to to tap into that that we may not even know with a safe environment and doing this could allow not just for the reframing but for the actual thought to come up now now that we're not in the situation that we felt that we were in before 
we could now in a different in different space revisit this from a different perspective and have be open to a change in our perception mm -hmm. and it's the change it's the it's the it's the mind being willing to loosen its grip on the traumatic idea and be willing to have a different idea accepted that takes that investment of belief that was in that original trauma thought and starts to dissipate it because now the mind is saying, well, maybe it's this other thing. Yeah. And that's what's so powerful about what you're saying yeah. about going back there and doing that. So what I was going to say about the thought. Um, so the way I got into therapy, um, I had I had been sexually assaulted and I was actually working for the Rape Crisis Center at the time. Um, and in order to go back to work, they were like, you have to have this paper signed. Um, and so that was my first introduction to therapy. And I started with cognitive behavioral head therapy, which is um, CBT, which is a talk therapy. Um, it wasn't until many years later, I was already clean and sober. Um, you know, I, I had already like worked on a lot of issues, had already killed a lot of things. Um, that I was introduced to EMDR, which was the first brain-based therapy that I was introduced to. Um, and the thing that I noticed that's different about CBT versus EMDR is the relational piece. Like, you don't have that in tune it, um, that with the therapist in, in certain modalities that you do in other modalities, which isn't a bad thing because, like, talk therapy tends to take a long time to heal but you have a really good relationship, right? Where brain-based therapies are very point, poignant and triggered, and so they, they sometimes are only one to two to three sessions, um, but you don't have that long-term relationship. How is brain spotting different in that aspect? Like, like it, it tends, for in my experience, I had that relational piece along with the effectiveness being quick like what is different about brain spotting in that well going back to what you were saying one thing about talk therapy is that it's talking to the prefrontal cortex here mm -hmm. so what brain spotting and modalities like emdr they go into the subcort cortical i'm sorry <laughs> you know, conscious back here yeah. we're the amygdala we're all the reaction from our body where it's stored this is where it's stored this is where it's got stuck mm -hmm. and it's through our vision that we see it mm -hmm. you know and so it's those mirror neurons and so when you're in like a session where you're with brain spot and we use a pointer and when you're focused you got the therapist who's giving you that safety but you're actually doing the work I, the therapist is not mm -hmm. she's just providing or he that safety that you can process that thought that what happened because when you had that trauma your fear like lisa said you know i'm afraid uh, my life is over i can't do this mm -hmm. i'm you know i'm not safe anymore you know you can process that thought and a lot of times you don't know how deep it goes and then as you're going deep you find other things that come up that happened before then mm. you know that you forgot about but it's been stored back there right it's been holding on to this trauma so like a veteran who's gone to war and that you know we talk about fireworks and cars backfiring and then they're on the ground because they're experiencing that trauma over because it's stored back there logically they know they're safe they're not there they're not in war but the brain doesn't know it right. so we have to let the brain know and this is what these 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 modalities do is they help you to just process it out and say oh i am okay i am safe now it's over right mm -hmm. so for me because i had done so much cbt it wasn't my thought process that was the problem like i knew how to take a negative thought and change it into a truth like you know that was something that i had it was a tool i had been given a long time ago um but when certain traumas came up through emdr and through life experiences and whatever in order to like heal those i needed something super poignant and super direct that could that could rewire yeah. that pathway because i'm not broken like I don't need to be fixed I just need to change the way I feel about something so talk a little bit about like how um, doing this process changes the way the trigger or the memory um, is is in response in the body 
Well, because it releases it. I mean, I've witnessed, I mean, doing sessions with clients where their body, they begin to shake. Mm -hmm. And if you think about a lion in the wild, if a lion gets in a, in a fight with another one, what do they do when they get back? You see them shake their bodies, right? And so they release that trauma. We don't. We, we, we hold on to it. Mm -hmm. So what this does is help you to release it so you'll see out experience people shaking or or there's going oh I feel sick or I feel and I just let them know it's gonna pass and it does pass mm -hmm. because it's their body releasing all that trauma that they've been holding on to so once they are able to release it then of course they're gonna be okay mm -hmm. it does help to have a change in experience from a feeling perspective that doesn't necessarily completely support yet the shift in perception to kind of be proverbially like you're in a pit and somebody's reaching down their hand and helping you step out of it it's like it creates because what what it sounds like you're doing when you're doing this is and even though it's not uh, building a relationship in knowing all the things in all the detail and working working through it talk it, with through talk therapy um, you, there still is a relationship that's happening because there is no way being somebody who's had a lot of trauma that I would trust somebody to do something with me unless I really believed like I said before that they can help me and that I could trust them and what I'm doing mm -hmm. to do it um, and then I'm sure, right, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, because I haven't done this, there is a little bit of talking involved, because as you're going through it, stuff's coming up for you, and you're shifting your perception, and you're realizing it. Yeah. There, there is one other thing that I want to say, and that is um, that, um, so... <sighs> So there are all these different tools, um, CBT, there's a f uh, affirmations, there's there's ways that people can say, well, maybe this isn't true, let me start practicing the, the positive thought. When I have the negative thought, let me flip the script. Um, and these are really good for, I like to picture a tree, and you have the root, and then you have the base of the tree trunk, and then you have the branches, and then you have all the, the leaves, and, and et cetera. And, um, all these branches are thoughts that are dependent upon and were even um, uh, are even created because of the foundational deeper traumatic ideas that were accepted like if I feel like um, I'm never good enough um, I shouldn't be here like if I've gone through like when my mom told me that she wished I was never born you know I had like this idea that I shouldn't be here well of course you can imagine as I go through my life I'm going to have well if that's true then this must be true mm -hmm. and if that's true then this must be true and so in interacting with people in school or interacting with the family members or or any situation, my mind would try to figure out who I need to be and whether or not I was okay and am I going to get my needs met, am I in safety or danger uh, based on these core ideas and so I had a myriad of what I thought was me, my personality, my self-image that was really just all supported by this idea, this deep idea, these deep traumas that I had where I believed something about myself on a very core level that was not true. Mm -hmm. And so while we can, and this is why we talk about the onion, you've talked about the onion before, yeah. why you go deeper and deeper through different different levels and you think you healed a thing and then wait, there's more because yeah. the supporting ideas were never pulled up by their root yet because it was just it was just too much. But once you get to a place where you're healing so many of these of the branches that come from something and yet, like as you were saying, there's still this deeper thing that's causing me to still lean towards a negative interpretation of a situation where I know, why do I keep going there? You know, there's something deeper, like with traumas, like rape, et cetera, um, to feel like, okay, I'm ready now. There's something else I have to go in a, a, a deeper dig. And to be able to then go and to do uh, something like brain spotting that really goes and like brings you safely back to the trauma in a way that like already starts to give you a different um, somatic experience, a different emotional experience, but yet at the same time um, allows you to more uh, safely ask again, is this entirely true? 
the interpretation the way I have been telling myself it is mm -hmm. this whole time. Yeah, um, and I mean, it, it's for me, I feel like it's given me a lot more peace. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's calmed me. I, f I mean, they were saying before we started that I smile a lot more today than I ever have. Um, and Lisa's known me for a while, you know. Um, and I feel like that it, it really does, like, rewire like I, I didn't know that that's really what would happen but I do feel like that's that's something that has happened for me um, in my experience and um, who do you think um, this could benefit like like if someone it, it could it benefit someone that's never done therapy before or is it somebody that needs to have worked out some of the onion um, to benefit from this oh it could help anyone I mean I don't know there is no limit to who it could help. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because, you know, the truth is, as an individual, you're the expert of yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's just to come in there and just talk. I mean, you're not going to do brain spotting in the first session anyway. Right. You're going to build on that relationship a little mm -hmm. bit because, like Lisa said, <laughs> they have to trust me. Mm -hmm. They're not going to follow. You're going to put a stick up in front of them and they're going to say, oh. A stick with a little cat on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you're not going to sit there and say, you know, this this woman's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, what is she talking about? I need to find some, you know. So you don't. You're going to build that relationship. But brain spotting is for everyone. So if they've never been to therapy before, that's okay. You mm -hmm. know, you can, and, and it and, and it can help so many different things. Yeah. I mean, even self-esteem could be used, you know, because if a person's thought mm -hmm. is I'm no good, well, let's face it, it's trauma somewhere mm -hmm. because somewhere down the line, Absolutely. someone's told them that they're no good. They're no good. Would you say that in your experience that um, somebody who is more uh, prone to having had trauma um, that they probably didn't even though it wasn't necessarily like heavier trauma but they probably didn't grow up in a way that gave them the tools to shake it off like the lion um to say oh well that happened but you know what da 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 da, -da to be able to deal with it do you do you think that um that it's uh partly because they they didn't know how to process information from uh, an intuitive place of trusting and that they are on a core level you know um, I feel like my question is circulatory because uh, cir uh, circular because um, if you had the trauma to think the things to be in the environment where you're not getting where you're not getting your tools where you're not going to have the right perception and then you're more you're more likely to have more trauma you know mm -hmm. and so that's a really good point actually is that mm -hmm. you're not just healing the trauma that you think happened before you're healing the part of the mind that wants to keep creating interpretations based on what you feel already happened and um, and instead of working towards the solution of getting to a place where it's less and less likely to do that um, really uh, really instead um, building upon a, a, a thought process that's not healthy um, but that being said question still um, do you feel like in addition to because uh, you're so focused on healing from trauma which I love mm -hmm. um, that teaching people the tools on um, how to process information um, because I'll say this last thing because you mentioned attunement you mentioned that you're very much that this is their process and you're a facilitator and you know the process you lead them through it and that you're a safe place for them um, but it's their it's their intuition that you're wanting to point them back to and um, and I feel like that to me is the best form the best focus of any therapy is to um, put them in touch with and to start trusting themselves. Absolutely. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. I agree 100% because the truth is, is that when they trust themselves, the healing really begins mm. then. 
you know Mm. it really begins when you start trusting yourself and stop taking what all these thoughts that you've had from your past or you know someone's told you something I mean one of my big things and it's so silly but it's not it's not silly you know this is the whole thing we think it's silly (laughs) but you know my parents always made me feel stupid Mm. they never came right out and said you're stupid but it was implied Mm -hmm. so I went through school went through life Mm. thinking well I'm stupid Mm -hmm. you know and Mm -hmm. I really felt it and then I go to college I went anyway and I was on the honor society Mm -hmm. you know I got my master's degree. I can't be stupid. Right, you right. Know? But I believed it. But then I proved to myself I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, you know, people with trauma, there's a lot of shame. There's mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, just a lot of different thoughts that they have. So if they can just trust that, hey, this is something that happened, but it doesn't make you who you are. There is a big difference between an event and an interpretation of an yes, event. Yes, absolutely. And if the mind is believing, like my mom, she called me lazy and a leech. What good, what good was I, right? So I would find myself in situations later, and you could tell I've healed it because I could just rattle it off, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not frozen feeling around the whole thing. But, but I literally would have the interpretation that somebody's thinking I'm lazy. Mm-hmm. Some a boss would call me into their office. I'm about to get fired. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, somebody would question. You know, did you really need to do this? Are Are you going to get this done by a certain time? And I think they think I'm lazy. You know, and it's, and we don't we don't we don't even recognize how much of the self talk that we have, our inner gaslighter, you know, mm-hmm. is going and telling us negative interpretations of situations all based on a, an idea, a traumatic idea that we have kept and we keep it and we invest in it and we nurture it and we, we do everything to keep this idea that's causing us to interpret and react to our environment in a way that doesn't allow us to have peace. And so being able to revisit through something like brain spotting, I could see how you can have a thought that's been supported a traumatic idea that's been supported and how so many of our ideas are supported by this idea that it could start shaking up the tree so to speak go yeah maybe this is not true and and have lingering healing effects because the mind that wasn't trusting its intuition at the time of the interpretation that was traumatic is now is now starting to Mm -hmm. around the topic and maybe that's not true and maybe I can trust this person and whatever like that and I'll also say that if you're in any kind of toxic relationship where you are accepting um, gaslighting which is um, a very manipulative projection onto you uh, basically um, basically the whole tenet of gaslighting is to is, is in the hopes that you will question your judgment and rely on their interpretation instead of your intuition. And so uh, another way that we need to heal is to start listening to our intuition, right? But we gaslight ourselves all the time um, and tell ourselves that maybe that person is true, is, is, is correct. And, and we, we are in dysfunctional, toxic relationships with people who talk to us in a way that matches our own internal self-dialogue, which is coming from our own trauma-based ideas. And so if you don't think you have necessarily trauma because nobody's ever diagnosed you or you haven't had a situation where you feel like this encompassing experience where you feel like you're reliving so much of whatever happened before, it's quite possible that you know that your trauma is fueling your um, codependency, your self-abandonment, your fear of failure, your your inability to step up and ask for what you need, your in, in a, inability to have healthy boundaries, your rationalization and saying that well that person loves me and staying in an abusive relationship or not getting into one because you're so afraid of getting hurt. Like there is so much that if you if you are watching this and you haven't actually thought about trauma um, that maybe uh, a dialogue can happen where you can see where you have some ideas that you that you hold on to as if they're facts Mm -hmm. 
And if and if somebody dares tell you that maybe your thinking is causing you to have the experience that you're having, that in reality uh, you're gonna you're gonna defend against that and go, you don't know what you're talking about. And the mind will go, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. You don't know. You know, I have to this, and this is what's real. And and we'll get so so. There's a saying if it's um, if it's hysterical, it's historical. Mm -hmm. And so the mind likes to 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 tell itself a story that like that protects the the self image, holding on to the traumas and saying this is all true i am this victim i am this this is who i'm supposed to be this is who i have to be in these relationships you know who would do this if i didn't do it and it becomes so normalized to the consciousness that stuffing feelings and denying that there's even a problem can be even a bigger sign of trauma um, until until one starts to get to a place where they recognize that um, that something, something has gotten to a place where they they can't they can't really function in the way that they really need to yeah. to heal. So, um, is yeah. there anything uh, that you want to yeah, say before just, we break? No, I just wanted to um, thank Leanne for coming and see if there was anything else that she wanted to add um, before we go to break. Well, I'd like to add just one thing, and that is what is trauma. Okay. You know, trauma can be anything because a lot of people have that idea that it has to be something really mm -hmm. traumatic, like, oh, I'm not a veteran. Or, right. No, trauma comes from anything that has made you feel uncomfortable or un unsafe or a victim, or a victim mm -hmm. anything like that. And, like, my, like I say, I should never say it's silly, but the thought that I was stupid really haunted yeah. me. It really was traumatic for me. And if anyone thinks that they have not had trauma in their life, mm -hmm. I'd like to challenge that. Yeah. Because where does anxiety <laughs> yeah. come from? Where does depression come right. from? I'm sorry. It comes from something that's happened in I your life. I don't think anybody that could have lived through the pandemic could say they haven't had trauma <laughs> exactly. in their life. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, seriously. Right. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're a beautiful soul, and I'm so grateful that you came and joined us uh, for this great topic on brain spotting. And thanks again, Tay Tay, yeah. for joining us uh, and sharing your experience as well. The opinions expressed here are strictly those of the people who gave them and do not represent any 12 step program or should replace your own intuition or professional medical advice. Thank you. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back to The Real Recovery Show. You can watch us on Facebook, YouTube, and on Amazon Fire TV, or listen to us on the PHLV radio app, or get our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if none of that means anything to you, you can go to TheMeetingSpace.com and click on The Real Recovery Show, where you'll see all the episodes that have, been that have aired so far posted there, as well as every week on Friday at noon, the new episode will air live. And so before the break, we were speaking to Leanne about and Tay Tay about uh, brain spotting. It's a very exciting new modality, a relatively new modality. And now we're joined here with Kelly Mosley of Mended Hopes. And we're super excited to have her. We really, really, really wanted her to be on the show. She has a lot to say, a lot of experience. And so now we're going to start off with her just sharing about what interested her in brain spotting as a modality to use in her therapeutic practice. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. 
Um, I'm extremely passionate about brain spotting, and ironically enough, I learned about it from my mom. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so she uh, went to therapy herself after just um, some really, you know, challenging years of her life, and she would not stop talking about it. And so it's kind of like when you go to a restaurant that you just have to tell everybody about how amazing it is. Mm -hmm. That has been what brain spotting has become for for me, for my mom, and um, so after hearing about it over and over, it was the second year of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of one of those people that, you know, I want to continue to grow each year um, that I get older. And so I did some research and I really wanted to do an in-person training, but they were only doing things virtually. And so um, I signed up and I was virtually trained by an amazing uh, practitioner, Lisa Larson, and she's out of California. And so I did phase one, and then I quickly signed up for phase two. And the way that brain spotting works is that as soon as you have completed phase one as a, um, you know, the phase one training, then you can go straight into um, using that in your in your work. And after phase two, you can start working on becoming certified. And so I worked on my certification, and I'm now for fully certified as a brain spotter. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Very interesting. And and so um, then when you first found out about it and you signed up and you got the book and everything, you posted that on Facebook. <laughs> I did. Right? <laughs> and as we mentioned in the beginning of the show, that's how Tay-Tay found out about it. Absolutely. Right. I saw that post and I was like, what is this? And so we were having a conversation while you were in the right. training. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, was fully, I was fully present. <laughs> That's funny. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, Leanne was talking more about um, dealing with people who have trauma, but just going on a more, um, I guess what you were saying, more more general population people, you know, with whereas brain spotting first started for first responders for 9-11, right? So in his book, David Grant actually talks about working with a figure skater. And that's in the book, the first um, kind of how he stumbled upon it. Right. So that was before 9-11, mm -hmm. the book, 2003 right? 2003 was no, no, the so, first time. Yeah. So in his book, he talks about um, how he was working with, um, he was working with first responders um, after 9-11 and he was using a different type of EMDR. I forget what it was called, but that's kind of where brain spotting was born. Mm -hmm. um, and then he went into working with the figure skater. Um, and so so it, it, it kind of was born from that, but it was originally, um, as far as I read, like as far as I remember reading it, it, it was originally like designed from that experience after 9-11 with the first responders that had gone, that had worked 9-11. Gotcha. Yeah. And so on a previous episode, if you haven't, um, if you don't know what EMDR is, we did a whole episode. It's really good. Um, just go back through the episodes and uh, look for that um, and watch it because it was really informative. EMDR um, can work very well with um, brain spotting. Brain spotting can work with a lot of different things. And, um, and so anyway, so just so you're up with us so <laughs> yeah. put this on pause it, yeah. go back to the mdr and you come go. right back and we'll see you yeah but because because they are both brain-based um right. therapies and there's other brain-based right. therapies but for as far as i know mm -hmm. um anybody i know that does emdr now originally did e um or anybody i know that does brain spotting now originally did emdr and it was that the experience with you did you do EMDR? i actually have never done oh, emdr okay. wow. but when i was in grad school back in the way back day yeah um emdr you know was coming out and it was definitely primarily for first responders they talked a lot about you know recovery for trauma from for the military and things like that so okay but you do brain spotting with the first responders and other populations. Correct. Um, yeah, so what, what are the different populations that you work with? So I have a full-time job. Um, I work for the state of Nevada, and I actually work um, in the juvenile justice population. Okay. And so um, I've used it with youth in corrections, actually in the correctional facilities. And I also have a private practice where I work with first responders, so a lot of corrections officers, uh, veterans, current military, law enforcement, you know, parole officers and um, also with elite performers. So that brings up an interesting question because uh, you do work with such a variety of people. 
you have on the one hand children who have maybe gone through some trauma in the home or whatever and then you have the the collegiate athletes who may be stuck on something and want to be better at what they do or get over something that happened at some point so that they can be better at their career or or heal from something and then you have um, and then you have first responders which is obvious right um, all the stress that's on those jobs um, and so some of them may or may or may not want to talk more about what why they're there some of them may be done with that some of them may actually be quite interested in the whole process so when you go and you first start um, doing an intake with them and getting them prepared mentally for this um, and physically like what would they have to what would they have to know so in each of those if you could just kind of take us if you will so that we can have like a visual of what the experience looks like in general because I'm sure it's different for every mm -hmm. client so if we start with our kind of juvenile justice pro uh, population um, so most of my work I actually you know learned brain spotting virtually mm -hmm. which was amazing and it has really opened so many doors right and so I can actually do that telehealth with most of my clients so I will do in person if I need to um, so one of our correctional facilities I have gone in and done you know face to face with some of our youth the interesting thing for them is each person is different you know some of them might want that you know one or two sessions to build that rapport and some might just want to go you know and so a lot of times I do especially with my private practice clients I'll have a you know a free consultation on the phone and so I kind of explain to them what brain spotting uh, supplies they're gonna need right and so if you have a consultation with a therapist just understand that brain spotting is just different than talk therapy so you know when you go to a talk therapist all you have to do is bring yourself with brain spotting um, just be prepared to bring your supplies and so the the main component is um, going to be some music and it's uh, music that's going to play um, alternating between the right and the left ear and it's not really anything that you need to be able to hear very well but it's more about the vibration and so we always ask for you know the client to have some type of either the phone or you know um, some type of device that can play that music do you send the music to them that you recommend or is there a specific type of music that you tell them to go download so um, when I'm in the correctional facility I actually bring my own little device and it's something that I've downloaded mm -hmm. um, there's different um, David Grand, you know, has different music that you can actually um, download. But um, for your client that I'm going to work with, te you know, telehealth, I just tell them to go to YouTube and you can look up brain spotting music. Oh, and I just recommend, you know, finding one that doesn't have any ads, you know, to interrupt a session. But that's so interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I've I've done brain spotting with the wand only mm -hmm. and only in person. Um, yeah. We tried to do the music and it was too much stimulation for me. I can Absolutely. see telehealth being yeah. a lot more convenient but I but it doesn't work for me mm -hmm. like I mean you know me I mean I need the energy in the room and right. so like but it's really cool to see that it is working for different populations and that way you can also do people that aren't just locally like yeah. you know you, you especially because I can't imagine business. there's a lot of therapists that are doing this yet and so or that are certified find, and that are really this good at it mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you <laughs> <laughs> well you know and that's true and so again any type of therapy that you're going to do your therapist should really be attuned with you right mm -hmm. we talked about attunement earlier mm -hmm. in the segment and that attunement just means the relationship mm -hmm. right right and so if i have a client that you know starts with the music and they are just not having it we don't do music right right or maybe it just was one of those days and they couldn't get set up in time you know what that's okay we're not gonna start brain spotting stressed out yeah, yeah <laughs> so imagine. we're gonna just be chill you know and that's the thing about this type of therapy it was intended to be simplistic in a way right and so sometimes I think as professionals as therapists we mm -hmm. can get really caught up in big fancy words mm -hmm. you know but the truth is is like brain spotting taps into the filing cabinet of trauma and stressful experiences that you have inside your mid to lower brain Mm -hmm. right and talk therapy just doesn't get there in the same way and I think mm -hmm. that that's what really attracted me to it um, during my training I had to be a client as well mm -hmm. and so you know I had my own history of trauma that in literally four sessions of brain spotting I mean I'm just functioning in a different way in life 
That's amazing. Know? Which is something we talked about earlier is that, like, you know, I smile a lot more, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's just, a, it does change your being. I mean, like, right. it really does change it. And we call that the brain spotting facelift, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so we can, you know, take years off that face. You know? <laughs> Imagine, for sure, because a lot of the wrinkles and the stress yeah. and the, the shoulders up to your ears, like, oh, she has a neck now. Right. Oh, I, I feel didn't like see I have her neck less, before. I feel like I have less gray hair. I don't know yeah. if that's true, but I feel like I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have way more gray hair than anybody here, but whatever. So... So okay, going back so to, you know, the juvenile justice population, again, um, all three of those populations have a lot in common. Mm-hmm. And I'm ser- I'm generalizing, right? Mm-hmm. Because each person is going to be unique in their needs. Um, but there's a lot of times, especially there's stigmas, mm-hmm. you know, um, in our in our maybe gender populations, in our communities of color, um, in our more, um, our military, our first responder populations, our professional athletes, right? There's a stigma, mm-hmm. um, especially with our, you know, Absolutely. our juvenile justice youth, yeah. right? You don't talk about your feelings. And mm-hmm. so again, with brain spotting, I can give them the option because I don't have to do a typical intake necessarily. If that client wants that time with me to build the rapport, um, we can do that. And we can do that as many sessions or as few sessions as they want. Mm -hmm. But with brain spotting, you know, I can go in and say, what do you want to work on? Mm -hmm. I want to work on my anger. Okay, tell me about the first time that you can remember feeling that level of anger. And then we go. And that's a five-minute It is really important because there is such a stigma, especially... I mean, there's, there's stigmas that stop a person from wanting to get into therapy at all. But when, it, when, when someone's concerned that someone else is going to see them as weak, like with first responder, it's a very macho job, you know, and they want to make sure that nobody ever questions their ability, the capacity to be able to handle a very stressful job. And so um, I can imagine that... Um, they would need to really get on board mentally with why they want to actively participate in something like this to really help them without that blocking them. So to, to understand where they're coming from, their headspace, and then children, I mean, I, I said this on a previous episode, or maybe even earlier today, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, today, but I said, um, you know, I said sometimes, um, I believe it was earlier today, um, But sometimes uh, what somebody ends up going to therapy for is actually just the effects of a buildup, if you will, from the interpretation based on that's that's representing their trauma. Like they had this core trauma and now they've been carrying that trauma that's that's been projecting out and having them interpret their experience over and over and over again so that the thing that they think that that's eating their lunch that's that's so upsetting them isn't even it yeah. like they don't even know why they're even really upset they don't even know why they even have the, the charge that they have mm-hmm. and so it seems like um you know a child especially who's gotten to the level and you can tell you know correct me in any way shape or form with this but i'm only going based on my own experience as a child mm-hmm. right at one point, a long time ago, because <laughs> I have the gray hair. But, um, but, um, but a child who has gone to the level of really needing help, oftentimes the trauma, um, they're more, we're more susceptible um, or prone, if you will, to have a trauma response because of a lack of foundation that gives us a sense of safety inherently anyway. We may not have the tools, we may not have learned from people modeling it for us to feel our feelings and to talk about things. We may grow we may have grown up in an environment where we have traumatized people parenting us. And so by the time you get a child who you might get because they have their own um their own issues towards themselves that are obvious, but mainly they're they're probably getting into trouble right now because they're in the juvenile correction. Correct. Right? And so by then, I mean, 
these are all symptoms. The acting out is right. a symptom. It's all symptoms of a deeper issue. Everyone knows that if you're acting out in class even, it's a symptom of, they always ask what's going on at home, right? right? Mm -hmm. Which usually upsets the parents because the parents know on some level something is going on at home. And so um, to gain their trust, to tell the child, we will work in, we will work with what you want to work mm -hmm. with, you know, and give them that sense of empowerment. Um, I feel like that's phenomenal, that approach. No, it's just been really amazing to watch. And, you know, one interesting thing is that I call it going in when they found the brain spot, right? And I can tell that they're really processing. Um, what I found specifically with this population is that they can feel it working themselves. Mm -hmm. And they might say to me, I want to talk about the time I was shot or I saw my homie shot, right? Um, and then we go there and mm -hmm. then they'll stop because mm -hmm. they're like, I don't want to let this go yet. Mm -hmm. Because if I let this go, then where does my hypervigilance coping skill, where does that go to? Mm -hmm. And so I get to then, we'll do some talk therapy at that point, some psychoeducation, some training, right? Some mm -hmm. teaching. Getting You're always going to have that survival mm -hmm. skill, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't leave the brain because we help process this memory so that it doesn't continue to have that hold on you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's really cool in that process, too, is knowing that they can still maintain who they are as people but let go of the pain. And that's what brain spotting does, and it works differently for different people, mm -hmm. right? So I've had clients that come in. We do a session the next week. They're like, I don't remember why I was upset last session. And they wow. cannot recall <laughs> what we even really addressed. And then you have some people, like my experience, I remember, but I don't have any emotional connection to it anymore. Where, you know, your generational, year after year traumas and right. those triggers, it doesn't happen for me anymore because the brain spotting kind of wiped that response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is, um, so the breakdown of trauma is that the mind takes a belief that it's interpreted the situation with, and it believes it. It believes it, it's not questioning it, and because it believes it, the thought is so out of alignment with any kind of peaceful type of thought, like uh, you have a peaceful thought that's intuitive, you feel a sense of peace, ease, comfort, safety, security, empowerment. When you have a thought that um, is is out of alignment with that, like uh, something that you believe about yourself or you believe about the world or about somebody that is terrifying, it's scary um, to the mind and the mind can't handle it. So the mind will still that's going for the trauma is actually it's actually creating the trauma by holding on to the belief and the belief is so intolerable that it will push it to the filing cabinet it'll push it into the back of the mind but it's not it's not inactive it still has that energy it still has that feeling attached to it mm -hmm. and so something will trigger it and they'll relive it whether they relive it as if they they believe they're totally back there or if they just really relive it on a, a somatic level they're still they're still reliving it because they're they haven't they haven't actually had a different experience with it and so by your going and doing that I could see how they're taking that thought and now and that you took that thought and now instead of feeding it anymore you're having a completely different a shift now where it got stored a shift that says you know what I'm not actually going to live with this belief as if it is the defining thing anymore. I'm not going to I'm not going to interpret my environment anymore based on this idea. And you know you, that child may have continued or that person may have continued being um, hyper well, excuse me, vigilant, but not necessarily hyper vigilant. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm right. saying because during this process, I mean, I you know, I can't say that I wish that anybody, you know, went through the childhood that I had. Um, but I can also say that I have gained gifts mm -hmm. from growing up the way that I did that I would not have had. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have had them if I um, if I grew up with a you know um, you know healthy minded parents um, in a in a structured safer environment. Yeah. And, you're right. Well, I mean, I feel like we. I mean, a lot of you hear that a lot in recovery, like people that are in active recovery. You hear all the time about how grateful they are 
that they were given these tools and mm-hmm. that they know this different path. And for me, I mean, I was so obsessed with the way therapy has changed my life that I went to school for it, you know? Like, I mean, and, and so I, I totally see that. True. But what I'm more speaking to is not what you gained in recovery or, um, or in therapy. I'm talking about how, um, how a trauma and how growing up or just having a trauma as an adult, how it shapes a person's perception long enough, the person's still growing, still experiencing lives, still having jobs, still ending up you know, in relationships, still, still interpreting themselves, their self-concept and their life as they go, and they're continuing to grow, but now they're growing with, um, with a trauma mindset incorporated in it. And so now, they've learned things on how to be a survivor in certain ways in a situation real or imagined that they found themselves in and those skills from being a survivor i mean i'm getting the chills right now you know it's like those skills um can stay with a person and as they get healthier using a modality like this now they're not crippled Mm -hmm. anymore it takes some of the energy behind it out and they still have what they know what they've learned though they're 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 even more better off for it Mm -hmm. so it's not like the therapy has replaced everything no you know like who would you be without this thought you know you're you're a totally different person Uh, she was this way and i don't know her anymore it's not even going to be like that it's just it's gonna it's going to take the energy out of it. It's going to allow us to, um, which, you know, honestly, um, that's the only way that we really can see anything sanely anyway is without the, uh, without the trauma, without the energy screaming at a level 12 to be able to calm down, to be able to have the, the visual of what happened and uh, to see it differently. It's huge. You know, and I know when I've healed something, when I no longer have that that right. uh, that energy, when it no longer makes me angry or feel like I'm going to cry mm-hmm. or anything. You know, like I, I, I legitimately feel free because my perception of it has been changed in it, and I no longer have the 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 old interpretation of the event. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think going back to again the filing cabinet concept, right? there's so much about the brain that we just have no concept Mm -hmm. you know and when we're going through those experiences our brain will even file those experiences away in the Mm -hmm. wrong alphabetical order yeah (laughs) right yeah and so again one of the really amazing things about brain spotting and one of the concepts is that we don't have to know what it is to know that it is Mm -hmm. right and so i don't even have to know Right. I've I have brain spotted a body pain and it has come to the trauma. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so our brain is so powerful that it can heal our body because what happens to the body happens to the brain. Mm-hmm. What happens to the brain happens to the body. And you know, I as I'm trying to describe and it, you know, kind of prep my clients for what brain spotting may be like for them. I like to say it's almost like watching a movie sometimes because you might start out with, hey, I felt really angry at the grocery store last week because, you know, it triggered this thing when Mm -hmm. I was a kid. Oh, I like this. And then all of a sudden, you're over somewhere you never expected it to be. And it's kind of fun to watch that as a clinician, you know, because this is happening without me talking. Right. Right? And Mm -hmm. so that's the difference, because I want to kind of reemphasize that. This is happening without us doing the normal talking. Um, There's been so many times that it's like, I want to work on this relationship with a parent. And then halfway through, you almost see the client smile and giggle Mm -hmm. a little little bit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, am I supposed to be forgiving? giving this person right now (laughs) hey is that what your brain's telling you to do you know and so it's just such a um powerful experience to be a part of i feel blessed honestly as the clinician sitting there because even though i'm not privy to what's really happening in every 
frame of the brain of the memories right. i can see it happening physically right. it's just it's so i just yeah. get so i, I, get, I can just I imagine your it. face getting all <laughs> smiley when they're all smiley yeah. like well, i see it's happening yeah one of the things that i love about brain spotting is what you're talking about where you're not actually knowing mm -hmm. every frame of what's going on because there's a lot of thoughts that i don't want to say out loud right and so like for me that's one of the biggest gifts of this is that like I can work through things mm -hmm. without having to expose them to another person. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Because sometimes if it's coming up in the beginning of it, there's things that are going to occur to a person and they're still necessarily might still have the coping mechanism of being guarded. And, um, and in order for somebody to feel safe and free to be able to face a thing, um, they, ha they do have to have the option of not needing to necessarily um, talk about it. But I was thinking when you said the mo a movie, it's kind of like where, um, do you guys know the concept? Um, it's uh, the, uh, oh, I would say the concept if I can remember it. Um, oh, the suspension of disbelief. Yeah. You know that concept? So suspension of disbelief is, um, and it's a cinema term, mm -hmm. and it means that when you go to a movie, the acting's really good, the scenery is really good. Um, the plot's really good. The storyline and um, and everybody and, and there's there's uh, the cinematography is really good. The sound effect, everything's good. And so you have like you're totally so engrossed. You you mm -hmm. buy into the movie that you have a period of time where you forget you are sitting in the seat. Right. Right. That's the the experience of suspension of disbelief. And so I can I can see that you know someone who has trauma has bought into mm -hmm. so much of their experience, and now it's almost as if they are watching the same movie the second time and the third time. Right. So I don't I don't buy in as much now because now yeah. I was like oh yeah I remember this part oh yeah 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 so there's still there's more so a part of me being detached uh, from the movie now and recognizing that I'm not. I'm not part of the experience of the movie itself. I'm I'm the one watching the movie, right? And I feel like that's that that's a good analogy mm -hmm. for um, for the ability to still watch the movie and appreciate the movie, but from a different perspective right. where you're not um, believing. This is why I can't watch scary movies because <laughs> scary movies. There's a part of my mind that goes. It could happen. <laughs> it could happen, and that's all I need. Yeah. That's all I need, and then yeah. the next thing you know, I, I I've. I am totally experiencing the suspension yeah. of disbelief. <laughs> and one of the really cool, you know, we talked about um, the elite performers, right? Mm. So there's even completely different, we call them setups, right? So different setups for working with performers um, because there's, you know, we're looking at the health factor. Surgery affects our brain, mm. right? right? Yeah. Um, so it's funny as I'm sitting in these trainings, I'm like, oh, all these, you know, places that I could work, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, for every surgery you have, you get a free brain spotting session, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Um, Leaving coupons. I, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, like concussions, right? That mm -hmm. there are protocols for concussions and sports injuries and, you know, working with our professional athletes, there might be a certain position where they were injured. And so every time they go up to, you know, perform that same position or they feel kind of that sense of deja vu like I'm back in that the scenario injured, the injured again. place but not necessarily Correct. having an injury anymore Correct. they're so used to compensating maybe right for the we time can go took. in and brain spot oh, that. that's very oh, wow. interesting and it's, a, it's amazing to watch that you know and just again with our first responders um they can tell me and I think part of what helps them um that population is knowing that I understand their world you know, so not only have been a therapist in corrections, you know, I work with officers now every day doing support groups and things like that. And so there's a lot of things that the community doesn't talk to mm -hmm. outside the community about. Mm -hmm. And so being able for me just to say, hey, I work in parole right now. It's almost like we've we've the handshake, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, you know, and we don't have to explain to each other. They know that I can sit with them. They know that if they were to tell me about a call that was really hard and they wanted to process that, that I wouldn't break down. And I think that's really important when you're looking for a clinician with your specific need is that you know that that clinician is gonna be able to hold that space right. without it becoming about them. Mm. Right. And brain spotting gives 
me the opportunity to say to the client, hey, guess what? This is not at all about me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so I, I prep them as well. If the spot doesn't feel like it's doing anything for you, tell me. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want you to pretend. I don't want right. you to impress me or feel right. like you're going to make me feel bad. This is really just about me facilitating this journey for you. Right. Um, and Leanne talked about that, yeah. too, um, about she's just there facilitating, mm -hmm. that it's this person's internal process. Right. Um, something you just touched on was about um, how, um, you, you know, when when someone's looking for somebody to do brain spotting with it's, it's they're they're comfortable with you because they know you're not going to break down what are some other things that somebody should be looking for so you know i think the biggest part is just knowing that that therapist um a lot of the websites will tell you i specialize in this right mm -hmm. i'm not going to have experienced everything that every client is going to come to me mm -hmm. but am i somebody that they feel like they can sit with mm -hmm. right so i think you know they will tell you 90 percent of therapy is that relationship mm -hmm. so do you feel like you can sit with that person right are they somebody that can sit with you you know in that unconditional regard the compassion the empathy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether they've experienced that themselves or not um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and so I look at systems you know so that's a big part of how kind mm -hmm. of my brain works and so it really just depends on what you're looking for <laughs> mm -hmm. you know I don't think that there's any um, special way obviously somebody that has done more training or is fully certified is gonna have you know just more experience behind them but that's just kind of up to your own individual Mm -hmm. preference absolutely okay and um, do you take insurance um, I do not okay and um, I, I am paneled though with something called 911 at ease okay. and that is for first responders and their families um, so you can go to that website um, and they will help support some sessions there again the great thing about brain spotting is I want to be fired really quickly yeah. right so uh, brain spotting actually works up to 72 hours after each session so I had a client kind of joke with me like they're getting you know four sessions for the price of one mm -hmm. um, so, because it just continues to process mm, right gotcha. yeah so um, I so it have continues not to stay effective after that but correct the but the healing part of it keeps going up to 72 hours. Right, so, you know, I know for my own journey, it was, there was different awareness, things that were popping up, memories that mm -hmm. I maybe hadn't had, um, continued to process up to three days after, you mm -hmm. know, I had Very sat trippy. in the session. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're solely looking for brain spotting, you're really looking short-term therapy. Mm -hmm. And so the investment, you know, that private pay could be um but you know i can also provide um a bill that you can submit to insurance if that's a route you want to take the really good benefit for the populations that i work with right a lot of times our first responders mm -hmm. even our athletes they don't right. want it on record no. with their insurance companies yep. that they they're going to therapy absolutely yeah um so she she just to reiterate something because she said the super bill so if you want to know more about that go back to the episode on detox because we actually talk about mm -hmm. um out of network benefits and what that looks like so. <laughs> <laughs> a little plug for all the other shows yeah. <laughs> we have to cover all of them just a little bit actually just watch them all you'll be good um okay and awesome and um and so you have a website and it is it's mendedhopes.clientsecure.me wow <laughs> i know very unique isn't it mendedhopes.clientsecure.me yes wow so i um, use the simple practice platform and okay that, that comes from there um and then leanne's is uh blue skies counseling plc.com do you guys want to be contacted <laughs> <laughs> you can also reach out to me mendedhopes at gmail.com now the other one is going to be your hipaa compliant i do have a telephone number too if that's easier 702-551-9380. It is easier. <laughs> Thank you. But I'll put the links below this video as well on thebeatingspace.com's website. And so thank you so much. Thank I'm sure we could have talked for a lot, lot longer. There's so much that you have to say and have to offer. And um, my God, what a what a healing force you are. Mm -hmm. I can tell how focused and knowledgeable and passionate you are um, for people who I mean, some of the people who help other people to be able to, 
you know, be able to, to heal some of the things that could be making them um, more at risk of either doing something that they shouldn't be or getting, um, getting hurt or, um, or not being completely effective in their job. So, and the children, I mean, mm -hmm. like, thank you, thank you, thank you, because that well, is like my, my biggest passion too. It's one of the reasons we started the meeting space mm -hmm. and created a whole children uh, glass enclosed room so that parents can bring their kids to meetings one, one thing Kelly said to me is that she's so passionate about this that she'll talk to anybody about brain spotting <laughs> at any time. <laughs> but she interviewed here first. <laughs> but now all you guys know all the ways to contact her. If you pick me up an Uber, I might talk about brain spotting. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, it's good. The interest that you know that you really are behind something when, when you're passionate, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're lit up about it and yeah. inspired. So awesome. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today on The Real Recovery Show. We'd like to give a special thanks to our sponsor and gracious host, PHLV Radio here in Las Vegas. See you next week.